Good morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the August 28th meeting of the Board of Supervisors. If we could begin with a roll call, please. Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. Here. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here. And if everyone could please join us in a moment of silence on the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes or additions to today's agenda? Uh, yes, there are two changes to the consent agenda. On item 38, there's additional materials. There's a revised memo, uh, packet page 372. And on item 53, there's a correction. Uh, the item should read, adopt 10 resolutions accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $1,401,851 from the Federal Emergency Management Agency and the Cal California Office of Emergency Services for storm-related projects for various county service areas as recommended by the Deputy CAO, Director of Public Works. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We are going to begin with uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us either on items that are not on today's agenda or uh, are on the consent agenda or on items that are on the regular agenda but have not been heard yet. If anybody would like to come up and address us, you'll have three minutes to do so. Please feel free to step forward. Good morning and welcome. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for all the work that you do as supervisors in this county. I'm really grateful for the work and the, and the commitment each week, so thank you. I, am, I have worked at a program called Second Story for a, about eight years and I'm the manager of the program currently. We were informed last week that our program is no longer going to be funded by the County of Santa Cruz and so we're, we're just setting a framework for coming here each time you guys are gathering and we, we're gonna just basically be putting up a petition for standing for our community needs. The program that has served people in the mental health system for eight years now and, and is a flagship of, the, of California and the nation. We're gonna be giving you information each time you're here to, to sort of make the cause and state the cause and, and see if we can help you to make a, a decision to save our program, save the community needs. And as a peer respite, we're all people who have worked there as a part of the system itself. So I've also gone through the system at some point when I was in my early days and, and still struggle with voices and, and paranoid and all of these things. And so we worked to, to share it with that, that sort of mindset allows people to accept their own experience. So people who work with these, sti these states of consciousness are very adept at being able to navigate and negotiate new realities for people. Our program offers a place of recovery and an exit door from the system. So we, we, we work with people to gain freedom, to gain liberty in their own lives, enough to be able to regain work, to go back to school, to go back to to community that they thought was lost. So this this program, I didn't consider it a program, it's a house, and it belongs to the entire community and not just to the peer community. Providers have spoken highly of it, family members love it. We're all, we're all in this together and there's not really a separate up, us and them as a result of this, really this landmark and foundational program. So I'll stop there for now and, and you, you'll likely see me again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. And even though I know your name, do you mind stating your, your name briefly? My name is Adrian Bernard. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Uh, hi, my name is Jeffrey Ellis. I'm here to comment on item 19 on the consent agenda. I, if I understand the instructions earlier, this is the appropriate time for it that. Um, at the risk of saying the obvious, uh, first of all, a, uh, a youth homeless shelter is a homeless shelter, and the siting of homeless shelters has been a, a difficult and, and sensitive issue. Uh, a, a decision that needs to be made by this board, not by uh, a county administrative agency. However, when you look at your uh, agenda packets for item 19, um, recommendation R5, the last recommendation, is that the Human Services Department should identify 
the location uh, for the, um, the homeless youth shelter and for the unaccompanied uh, children's shelter. This looks to me like a delegation of authority, and if that's what it is, that, that's a mistake. You should not delegate such authority to the Human Services Department. Uh, with all due respect to those folks, <laughs> they're not elected to make this kind of decision. That, that's your job. So I, I ask you to clarify the wording that the um, ser Human Services Department will recommend a location perhaps recommend several locations rank ordered for your consideration, and you will make the final decision after uh, providing uh, the public with an opportunity for input. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Hi there, my name's Tracy Kennedy, and um, I'm here today to address you regarding the recent decision made by Santa Cruz County Behavioral Health Director, Eric, Riera and in conjunction with Encompass Community Services to close down the second story peer respite house. Second story was opened in the fall of 2011 and was the first peer respite house here in California and only the seventh in the um, country. Um, the second story model has been so successful that over the past seven years, many other organizations seeking to open a peer respite in their area have come to meet with the staff and tour the program. Um, most recently, we had um, visitors from out of the country even coming uh, to take a look at our program. Um, Second Story is seen as a model to be emulated. Um, Second Story is not just a program, but a culture of recovery and mutual support. And among those who walk through the doors are people who are struggling to hang on while searching for permanent housing, those who would otherwise be hospitalized, those for whom connections and friendships blossom, people struggling with home environments, those changing medications and needing to be in community while doing so, and so many more. Guests go into the house alone and come out with friends that they can call on for support, hope for their future, and renewed energy to carry on with their battles. There's a huge concern surrounding homelessness in our county, and programs such as this one support people in getting housing, staying stable through that process, and also regaining shaky stability, which is threatening their current housing. Connections are also made, creating an opportunity to look for housing that they can share with new friends, expanding the available market to them. But enough of the benefits of this program. I can spend the entire morning telling you all about how wonderful it is. Um, the announcement of this decision was trauma-inducing. And our program has been utilizing trauma-informed systems for years in an effort to ensure that people are not traumatized nor re-traumatized while um, in the house. Um, this decision has created trauma for, for all involved. And some may think that we're simply a community of peers and therefore would have nothing to add to the conversation, and that's most definitely not true. Uh, we've begun to organize to find solutions and a way to save the valuable program. So I ask you this morning to consider the great loss to our community and the real implications that closing Second Story will have on it. The obvious financial savings are not the only ones. It may indeed be false savings. Think about the trickle-down effect, the increase in hospitalizations, the increase in homelessness, the greater demand on the remaining beds available. And <clears throat> we think that losing six more beds in a time where um, beds are very difficult to come by um, would be a great loss to the community. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, Chairman Friend, uh, Board of Supervisors, uh, Gary Richard Arnold. Um, an unelected majority uh, met with secret meetings and no minutes that changed the rules of this Board of Supervisors. The unelected Carlos Palacios, the County Administrative Officer, submitted the so-called change. Not only that, he got it on the agenda, uh, Carlos Palacios recommended it. So, in fact, you are rubber stamping something that you never initiated at all. Uh, it, it is a, uh, uh, it's a political, uh, 
protection plan for the incumbents. The censorship reigns high in Pinedistan. Uh, we recount the uh, political incumbency endorses, uh, has always been endorsed by the Sentinel. Uh, Ryan Coonerty uh, shut down one third of the uh, member of the public to talk before the city council of Santa Cruz, and that still remains in effect, is stifling public comment. The threat to the people and the property of the Grange were made by the board chairman here and John Leopold, and apparently that's okay with the other three members that appointed uh, Zach Friend as chairman of this board that can threaten property in people's lives. Um, Zach Friend and this board honor the Chinese communist and Russian spy Hugh DeLacy with two plaques on the courthouse steps out here. The United States Congress, the state of Washington, and the democratically controlled state, of le state legislature of California said Hugh DeLacy was a communist enforcer. Apparently this enforcement and censorship is reaching East German uh, proportions. Uh, the head of the CIA, Leon Panetta, sent this Russian spy military and policy information. Panetta also founded California forward, of which, of which Mr. Bruce McPherson has been a member uh, for a long, long time. It's funded by huge foundations that don't pay taxes like Packard and Irvine and Haas and Commonwealth. It is basically a shadow government while the authority of this Board of Supervisors and the City Council are moving their authority to a Soviet called AMBAG, Association of Monterey Bay Area Governments, in which the Sentinel or any of the media never reports to the people. The people here have the slightest idea what you're doing to them. You adopted the Rosenberg Laws, uh, which belong in North Korea. It was put together by uh, the League, uh, it's endorsed by the California League of Cities, which is nothing more than a politician's lobby. Uh, it's, it's interesting to find that uh, it was, uh, the police stood down last year, UCSC, uh, when the ombudsman on that campus were calling uh, for help. It was also interesting that Zach Friend, I believe, was a policeman spokesman years ago when uh, uh, Antifa type mass people went through uh, the city breaking windows. I think you need to uh, change your chairman, uh, fire Mr. Palacios, or either quit yourselves as he's running the whole uh, bag together. This is the Soviet and you know it. Good morning. Good morning, um, my name is Shalaka Bonas. Uh, I love Santa Cruz and I have the privilege of serving as the chairperson of the Mental Health Advisory Board uh, elected by John Leopold and uh, under the leadership of Greg Caput, which has just been an amazing privilege to have and um, serve with other people that you've elected who are amazing people who are really passionate and involved. I'm here to make uh, an announcement and invite. Um, is there a way I can hand you guys flyers? I'll take it. Uh, September 10th is World Suicide uh, Prevention Day. And we will be having a uh, candlelight remembrance at the clock tower at 6.30. Uh, Conan from uh, Suicide uh, Prevention Hotline will be there as well. There'll be a moment of silence and a moment for people to uh, speak in remembrance of people lost uh, to suicide. Uh, thank you very much. Any, any questions, sir? Uh, the veterans will be there too, they've been invited? Yeah, they've been invited. It's open to uh, everyone in the community. I've made more flyers I'll put up in the hallway if anyone wants. I, I want to thank you for everything you're doing with the Mental uh, Advisory Board. You're doing a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for your service very much. Thank Bye. you. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. My name is Monera Crawford. I live in San Mateo County. I came over to your nice, wonderful county to tell you that I've discovered uh, tax fraud, property tax fraud, at your county recorder's office, and nothing is being done about it. In fact, the law states there's no statute of limitations when you alter the public record to steal tax money. Now, this person stole, uh, filed five forged deeds and has been doing this for over 20 years. We have contacted everybody in this city, senators, supervisors, the DA's office, who has a thing on your thing, number 32 today. They have not investigated it. It's a loophole that allows anybody to walk into your county recorder, file a grant deed, even if it's fake, even if the notary seal is fake, no one checks. They tell us it's not our job to check to see if this is a fake document. And he did it intentionally to steal property tax, okay? 
I tried to contact somebody about the property tax. Who goes after property tax evaders? I was told it was the Board of Equalization. I submitted all the documents to them. Six months later, they said, we don't investigate property tax fraud. There's a big problem going on because this law is being ignored even by your DA. Section 115 of the Criminal Code, uh, Section uh, 6200 of the Government Code says theft of public money, there's no statute of limitations. You can prosecute them 50 years from now. Also, filing of a forged document, which we can prove. So that's what I'm coming to talk to you about, that you need to start paying attention because this affects every taxpayer in Santa Cruz County. It pays, it affects all of your homeowners. I walked into the police department, I said, what if I take, steal your property? What are you gonna do? No answer. What if I could go down and file a fake deed and steal your property right now here in California? And I can do it. I can download it right off the internet, get a grant deed, go down here, pay the $57 fee, and steal your house. What do you do? You have to go down and hire a lawyer, pay him $15,000 or $20,000 to go get your house back. That's ridiculous. Also, filing the forged deeds, five of them in a row, and there's, t right now, if you go into the tax assessor's office, that forged deed is right now on that property. Okay, he has not paid the correct tax for over 20 years. So that's what I came to talk to you about. And if you, any of you want to see the, the deeds, we'll be glad to show them to you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi, I'm Cheryl Poland. I'm a 20 year resident of the 5th District, and I'm here to talk about two things starting off the, uh, the new Santa Cruz, Santa Clara County roundtable that's being put together. I think you've all seen the letter from Congresswoman Eshoo, Congressman Panetta regarding joining or participating in the roundtable. And um, I just wanted to make sure that all of you understand that the select committee had unfinished business at the end of it. There are residents in Watsonville residents in Scotts Valley, Los Gatos, Los Cumbres, who are suffering from San Jose arrivals and um, southern departures out of SFO in Oakland. They need representation on the round table and our expectation is that you all will participate. The other thing I'd like to speak about is I'd like to understand what the board's plan of action is regarding the lack of progress on the select committee recommendations. It's been two years. We've seen no progress whatsoever. Outside of our congressional reps, I've not seen any activity from this board amplifying their message that people are suffering here. And things have gotten a magnitude order worse over the past couple of years since the select committee. I'm sure you're aware Surfer 3 is a lower, louder procedure. It's dropped 1,000 to 1,500 feet over Surfer 2. That in turn has pushed the BRICS arrivals down to less than 5,000 feet when they cross the summit. The southern departures have dropped 15,000 feet. They've, they're down to 12,000 feet when they cross the summit. So it's awful, 400 planes per day, 24 by seven, and we don't see any action from the Board of Supervisors. We'd like to understand what the plan is, and it would be great if we could get some answers at the next Board of Supervisors meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Good morning. My name is George Silva, and uh, I think you've already heard from my caregiver, Manera Crawford. Uh, I'm up here for much the same reason. Um, number 32 on your items here, Justice and uh, Public Safety. I uh, have a problem where in the process of what we've been doing, I have gone to the District Attorney's Office in Santa Cruz, the Sheriff's Office in Santa Cruz, the uh, Legislative Office up here on the, what, the fourth floor, and they have looked at our evidence, and the lady that I talked to said, isn't that against the law? I said, thank you, you know, yeah, you're right. And she enumerated, these are all 
prosecutable offenses. She sent us over to Jim Hart. I went over there and I found Mr. Durer in the uh, lobby, the investigator that we asked the first time to investigate this. To this date, we have not get, gotten any satisfactory input. You know, what's happening? We're kept in the dark. Any p people we call in the uh, offices here, they point a finger somewhere else. Call this guy, call that guy. It's a runaround. What I'm asking from the Board of Supervisors is to establish some kind of criteria for our offices that when someone comes in with a problem, address it. Treat them like a citizen, that they have an interest in what's going on. The law is there. We have good laws on the books, but if they're not prosecuted, why have them? Why should I sit there and say, oh, I'm protected? The law here says if this guy does this to me, he's going to be arrested. Oh, no, he's not even going to be prosecuted. And he knows that. So why not do it? Even if I'm caught, nothing's going to happen. The court's too busy. I called uh, Paul Ramos from the Sheriff's Department, called me back and said that the district attorney says they're too busy. That's what he told me. They're not going to prosecute this. We got, gave him the evidence. My uh, question to you is, can I be involved in uh, line item 32 here when the time comes to talk to Craig Wilson, to Jim Hart, and find out and get something in writing why I can't have my uh, issues addressed? I, I'm a veteran of 40 years in the Marine Corps. I was in Vietnam and Desert Storm. I fought for the justice for everybody. Why can't I get it? That's all I have to say. Do you have any questions for me? No, sir. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi. Good morning. Um, my name is Debbie Hakeem. I live in the first district in Soquel. Um, the reason why I'm here again today is because of the flight pass that I'm enduring. My family, my neighbors, and everyone, we're really suffering quite a bit. Um, I lived in Boulder Creek for 14 years under the old flight path, and during that time, I never in my life had heard air traffic like I do in Soquel 24 hours a day, woken up several times throughout the night. Back in April, I was diagnosed with a stomach disorder. In the last two months, I've lost 20 pounds, and they couldn't find anything physically wrong with my body, so it has to be from this lack of sleep and not giving my digestive tract chance to heal throughout the night with them sleeping. And I really need help. I don't know what else to do. I sleep with the fan on at night. I still hear the planes. I've tried earplugs. I get ear infections. I mean, I'm ready to have a nervous breakdown. I am losing it. I don't know what else to do. I would have never bought this forever home if I would have known that I was going to be in a flight path. I am struggling, and I'm begging you to please help us. I don't know what else to do anymore. I can't even, I don't know. But that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, my name is Ed D. I'm a, a resident um, of District 5, and I'm here to express my displeasure at the support from the Board of Supervisors on the plane issue. Um, uh, like the woman before me, you know, this has been going on for over three years now. We are getting extremely sleep deprived. I apologize if I'm at all uh, rude or out of bounds today. I'm gonna do my best, but, um, you know, the planes are now flying uh, below 5,000 feet above my house. I live at 2,300 feet, and all day long I'm reporting it, reporting it, reporting it, and we are just, as your constituents, it, growing extremely frustrated, tired of trying to move this action forward. We worked with the select committee. We had everyone out. We got our recommendations, and nothing is happening. We're not getting any relief up there. It's getting louder. It's getting worse. I invite any one of you to come to my home and just sit there for an hour and listen. I mean, it's like we're on the, we're on the landing path to the airport. I mean, it's like we're on Heading Street, and they're flying right over, and that's not the homes we bought. I am a real estate agent here in Santa Cruz County. My buying clients are resisting buying homes homes that are directly under the flight. They, everybody's asking about it. There's enough press out there. People are aware it's a disclosure item now on our homes in the mountains. And it's a real tough situation. We want your support. We voted for you guys. We want you to stand up for us, okay? We've already got the select committee recommendations. We just need to push them through. We just need to get everybody to do what they said they were gonna do. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. 
I'm Stefania Pietraszek, and um, up until three years ago, I never stood in front of anybody talking about anything because I don't like doing this. And I had a little list of what I was going to go through and where I was going to start. But let me start with trauma, mental health, loss of sleep, and PTSD. There have been other members of the community talking about the support they need for people that have this and how important it is. And I see the heads bobbing up here, no disrespect intended, and you have thousands of people that you have promised to help under these jet pads who have trauma, mental health, loss of sleep, PTSD, and it is getting worse. Some of you sat on the select committee. It was a democratic process. What was the select committee? Was it a puppet show? Was it just a great reason to sit in traffic and go up to, Sam, uh, to uh, Palo Alto and eat at an overly expensive restaurant? We need you to follow through. We need you to contact our congressional reps. They should not be the ones going, wait, there's even a discussion as to whether or not we're joining a round table. It might not be your constituents right now, but are we gonna let this continue? Is there any question about the validity or the sanity of joining this round table you've been invited to? I understand there's some discussion about, eh, maybe we don't wanna do that. They came for us three years ago. They'll come for your constituents too. Do what you said you were gonna do. Don't make fools of all of us that took time off from work, got in there, drove up to Palo Alto, sat there for I don't know how many dozens of hours, worked through the process, and now there's just rip, roaring silence. We need these things addressed. There is a solution there. It needs to be pushed through. Please do your jobs. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hi, my name's Jill Boatwright, and I live um, in Las Gatas on Zianti Road, uh, right under the Plains. I'm also here for the Plain issue. Um, we need your help with returning the surfer route to Big Sur as suggested by the Select Committee. I agree with the person in front of me that w was all that time wasted? There were a lot of people, spent a lot of time in that, <laughs> went all the time. Um, what was that all about? I just think it would be a waste of a lot of important people's time to go through that process and not uh, respond to any of the select committee recommendations. Um, it's been three and a half years since it, this started and we're still suffering. Um, this is sleep deprivation that you're seeing right now <laughs> because I couldn't sleep last night and I have constant exposure to planes over my house. I can look in one of my bathroom windows, skylight windows at night when I get woken up and walk in there and see the planes go right over me. Surfer 3 was supposed to be an improvement or something that was touted as that. Oh, it is lower, it's louder, um, and there's more speed brakes. So that hasn't helped anything actually I believe there's, there's more planes going through. The number of planes are quicker as well. Um, please remember, it was the fault of the Board of Supervisors that neglected to let the public know about the planes coming that forced us to be in this mess to begin with. Therefore, we are asking for your help to try to get this problem resolved. Um, I'm here to ask you to participate in the South Bay Roundtable, and I'm hopeful that you will appoint John Leopold, who is the one person in here that knows the most about this extensive process that they had to go through to even make select committee recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> morning, thank you for waiting. Good morning, my name is Erica Miranda. I'm the former Behavioral Health Corp Peer Navigator and I currently work for Encompass, but I'm here as a private citizen and a resident of the third district. I'm lucky enough to work with Tracy uh, at Second Story and I came here because I read that life gives us the same lessons until we learn from them and since <coughs> I've recently learned a very difficult lesson. I wanted to share that with the Board of Supervisors. Ten years ago, I gave up. Uh, I know I did because that's when I applied for disability. I flunked out of college. I left a full-time job because of my panic attacks, and I decided to stay home forever. Uh, I still cost the place that I lived lots of money, 
because I had seven surgeries, three chronic illnesses due to my lifestyle, and I spent weeks in the hospital. I honestly believed that I was totally sick and I would never get any better or live any differently. What made a change in my life is that I learned about recovery, peer support, peer respites, places I could have gone instead and learned how to take responsibility for my own life and take control. Instead, I was involuntarily hospitalized and over-medicated. By the time I started working as a peer, I had tried over 35 different psychiatric medications and I was currently taking 12. When I moved to Santa Cruz County, I loved my job. I worked full time, uh, the funding ran out. And so in the end, uh, I had to reach out. I had to learn that I got through those tough times of feeling like I was back uh, in that abyss by learning to reach out and by leaning on my peers and coworkers at Second Story. They taught me how to do that because when peers come together, there's nothing about us without us. As we learn to recover, we teach others to recover. It's what we do. Peers will recover from the closing of this facility. Uh, however, I don't think that Santa Cruz County will easily recover from the loss of those beds, the space, the wealth of knowledge that is there and the recovery culture that Second Story has been first in the state of California to implement. This is the way forward. This is the direction of our future and the fabric of what I do and what is meaningful to me. Please fund the rest of our fiscal year because we can recover. We will find a way to continue this program, but we can't do that in the emergency shutdown that's happening November 30th. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Good morning, <clears throat> my name is Ann Steinloff. I live in SoCal and I'm also horribly affected by the jet flights that we've suffered with for the last three years. And I'm here to urge you to um, approve and join the uh, new SFO round table that we've been asked to join the Santa Cruz, hopefully Santa Clara, Santa Cruz SFO round table. <coughs> I mean, I, I can't understand why we wouldn't want to be part of this. We have this hideous problem. Um, I won't go through all the suffering, you know, that I've had as well as the entire community. So essentially I, I want this um, round table. I want to be part, I want us to be part of this round table. And uh, please carefully think about that and vote in favor of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, welcome. Good morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aptos. Uh, continuing on with the previous speaker, I wanna know why, as I've been told by a number of people on this issue, Supervisor McPherson and Supervisor Coonerty, you have told the FCC proposing round table discussion, Santa Cruz County is not interested. I don't understand that. And if it's not true, then please clarify, but that's what people are being told by the organizers. Um, I also wanna protest the combined public comment of consent agenda items and on non-agenda items that effectively reduces public comment. And also that uh, members of the public must now beg you to pull off items on the consent agenda. To that end, I wrote Supervisor Leopold and Supervisor Coonerty yesterday to ask you to take off consent agenda item 62, which gives exclusive contract agreement with Barry Swenson Builder to build a hotel at the Upper Harbor at 7th and Bromer. I got no response from either of you. So how effective is this process that you have instilled to shut up the public? And that's the criteria that the CAO is going to use. How many times consent agenda items will be pulled off? That will measure the success of this new measure policy on public input that you have put in. It is a gag order for the public. I wanna say that I'm against this contract with uh, Swenson for a hotel at 7th and Bromer. That is not at all what the people said they wanted 
at the public hearing that the county held on April 27th, 2017. I was there every time a hotel picture went up and the idea was floated, people boot and hiss. So why are you doing this? And why is the planning department ignoring the initial uh, redevelopment con contract that made that area a park and open space? This is, this is not acceptable and your policy is disgusting in the way you're shutting up the people. I also want to take issue um, with n number 37, the gray key uh, software that will allow the sheriff to unlock iPhones and Apple products and extract data. I think this could be used as an invasion of privacy and needs your, needs a good public oversight and I would like to ask that the commission be formed to do so. I also, um, I wanna support the action on item 29 to uh, go against the uh, state SB 3157 that will allow a, a multitude of public right of way cell towers, mini cell towers. Um, because I'm running out of time, I also just wanna point out that on item 44, the MGA amount for the county is um, over double of what it is for the Santa Margarita. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the brief opportunity to speak. Thank you. Mr. Chair, just real briefly, I wrote you back, Becky, I wrote you back this morning. I apologize that I didn't get you sooner. I said uh, that since this is not a contract to build a hotel, it's a contract to enter into negotiations to bring a hotel forward or a project for potentially a project forward that have lots of public process that I wouldn't I wouldn't support pulling it at this time. It, would anybody else like to step forward to address us during this time? Please. Thank you. <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm here to talk about um, second story encompass community services. Um, Three weeks ago, I was ready to kill myself. I was having constant panic attacks. I um, was having horrible mood swings. However, um, when I went to telecare, I was told I didn't meet the qualifications for a hospitalization. I was absolutely a danger to myself. Um, I heard about Second Story through my caseworker at the county and um, uh, since I've been there, my mood has genuinely improved. I feel a little nervous right now, but um, <laughs> I, um, I feel hopeful and I feel confident and I'm enrolled in school now and I'm alive and I'm happy to be alive. And it's because you can't replace the wealth of knowledge and information that peer counselors can give to you. Um, me trying to find help through my friends and family, didn't work because they don't understand what it's like. Um, Encompass knows what it's like and um, I can credit them, I think I can credit them for the fact that I'm alive today. Um, yeah, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Good morning, um, I'm Karen Fagundes and I am the um, victim of the identity theft and fraud, forgery and everything that Manira Crawford and George Silva were explaining and we sat in front of you and talked and you said you did nothing for the DA and the sheriffs except for their money. But according to the uh, county structure that I read, you guys are over them. So when we talked to you, you could have given me a little more guidance, I think. Well, let me just, I just wanna interrupt because a couple of people have spoken on this. The DA's office have, have declined to file your case. The Board of Supervisors does not have authority to require that the DA's office uh, file a case. The Sheriff's Office has investigated. They passed it on to the District Attorney's Office and they, and they declined to file. I'm happy to meet with you again and have this discussion outside of, of here. I mean, I'd be welcome to do that, but it, it is. Um, Can you explain something else to me then? outside of that, what goes on in here. Like I had to go through a FOIA act to get all these forgeries or some of them and your county assessor sent me this PCOR. Do you know what a PCOR is? Prelimin preliminary change of ownership. So if I sell property and somebody else buys it, they put one of these in. They don't generally get recorded, yet this one is. This got sent to me by Sean Saldavia. He would read the front, I am the seller. And there is a buyer and on the last page, it gets signed by the buyer. And look at, my name is there, the seller. Why would I do that? 
And this came from your assessor's office. And when I confronted him and county council about it, they looked at me and said, I don't know, I wasn't there. And I go, really? Neither was I. So how do you, how do you expect me to accept this and everything else that's going on? You don't want to investigate it. Why? These are felonies. He's a felon. This is criminal. And it's not just me. How many more are out there? We don't know because people are afraid to come forward because nothing happens right. as we see. And I'm not ready to sit down yet. I said I will carry this to the end. I'm not done yet. If you guys do nothing now, I'll keep going. Maybe 50 years down the road, but you know what? We're going to find out what happened to Kennedy, and we're going to make sure that this comes to justice just as easily because this is not acceptable to say it's too long ago. He's still a felon. He's still, I'm still finding forgeries. So how many more are out there? What happens if he dies and I find out my name is everywhere else? But we didn't find it because we didn't look. How do you expect me to accept that? Well, ma'am, I don't think anybody's asking you to accept it. I mean, Apparently I think you that, are, because no, not going to do anything. Ma'am, please. Um, when we sat with you, we believe what you're presenting. Uh, you have a lot of information, but the Board of Supervisors cannot compel the District Attorney's Office to file a case. That is their right. I ask a lot of law, law enforcement agencies, too. I mean, this is, uh, anyway, I'm happy to meet with you again, but the authority of the Board of Supervisors is not to compel the District Attorney right, to file a case. All right, we do need to meet okay. again because I did finally record the deed that he never recorded because it's not a law in this county to record deeds. Therefore, that's how people steal. Okay. You guys have a fraud um, team, but you don't do anything. Where's your real estate fraud team? Why aren't they jumping on this? I appreciate it. I, I will meet with you Thank again. You. Yep. Good morning, welcome. Good morning. An inconvenient truth here, and thanks to all the previous speakers. We are being assaulted by microwave radiation from various sources and listening to the people who live under the flight path, horrible, this needs to be halted. A factor in the, with the noise and the flight is that these planes have transponders. And I was with a friend in the Santa Cruz Mountains who lives isolated because the smart meter radiation nearly killed her. She's also under the flight path. This is right near the border, Santa Cruz County. So I have my detector up there, and she has one. As the planes are going over, this is pulsing up. So there's also radiation exposure each time these planes go over. This is an acousticom meter, one device to measure it. It has a sound component. This is what is hitting our cells. And I'm gonna give you another paper, uh, paper here. One of the problems is that these are pulse microwaves. Here's the effect of pulsed microwaves, which is what these wireless devices do. They pulse. It's kind of like being punched repeatedly. Causes leakage in the protective blood-brain barrier, affect the opiate dopamine neurotransmitters, affects sex hormone levels, shown to decrease sperm production in men, shown to affect heart rate and heart rate variability, EEG, EEG changes also in sleep, reduction of learning, memory problems, shown to lower hormones, melatonin, pineal gland hormone, affects sleep. Pulse EMFs, electromagnetic fields, were estimated to have two and a half times more adverse effects than continuous microwave radiation. While Supervisor Leopold, you um, expressed the opposition of this board to the 5G rollout now planned on the federal level, at the same time, the county is rushing through more of these radiation emitting antennas that cause these effects in the public right of way. And again, you are not doing anything to protect the public. It's rollout for the telecom corporations, and you need to be protecting public health, not corporate profit. Thank you. 
Good morning. Thank you for waiting. Hello. My name is Susan McKinnon, and I've been a resident of Santa Cruz County for 29 years, and I'm here today speaking on behalf of Second Story as a guest of this respite house. In February of this year, a series of events in my life caused me to be hospitalized for psychiatric reasons. I was brought to Telecare, a 16-bed facility in Santa Cruz. They didn't have an empty bed, so I was sent out of county to Sacramento. I was without a change of clothes. I was without toiletries or any personal belongings. I was also too far away for my family to visit me or friends to visit me. The treatment I received at this facility was beyond subpar. They withheld my asthma and my seizure medications, and as a result, I suffered asthma attacks and a seizure while under their care. When it came time to release me, I was shown the door 160 miles away from my home. I was told when I left telecare that transportation would be provided home. Eventually, the hospital sent me home by Greyhound bus. For someone who has never needed acute psychiatric care, I was shocked and appalled, as well as further traumatized by the whole ordeal. I have since become aware of Second Story, and I have stayed there a number of, a number of times. I believe it has helped me to avoid further hospitalizations and move my life forward in a positive direction. Second Story offers our community a unique resource for people moving through difficult circumstances and helps them possibly avoid cost, costly hospitalizations that are not only difficult on the patient, but are difficult for their whole family. I'm here today to ask that the emergency, some, some emergency funding may be provided to keep this resource available to our community because I believe it is valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name's Jessica Brown, and I've lived in Santa Cruz County for 38 years. I'm here today to speak to you about the Second Story Respite House program. Last week, it was announced that this program will be closed December 1st of this year. I've worked at Second Story as a counselor now for over three years, and previously, I stayed there as a guest twice. Uh, people who experience mental health challenges and need support have very limited options. At Second Story, all staff are peers, people with lived experience of mental health challenges. As staff, we relate to the Second Story guests as equals, and we provide a supportive environment that encourages growth and self-determination and builds community. As a single parent, I was afraid to lose custody of my child, so I never sought help for any mental health even though I needed it. Excuse me. After my child turned 18, I did seek help. I went to the hospital and it didn't do anything for me. And I was sent home. And at home, there was nothing. I went to the hospital again and it still didn't work for me. I decided to give Second Story a try. And at Second Story, I found a place where I could be around people, and people that were peers, and they were welcoming. It was easy, and it provided me community, and I no longer felt lost. And people saw the value in me when I hadn't seen any value in myself for years. I was encouraged to apply for a job and I received one as an on-call counselor. I hadn't worked a regular job in probably five years, and today I'm at the healthiest place I've ever been. And to me, I think it's a huge loss to the community and a disservice to close our program. People come and find relationships that are lasting and build a community of support. So thank you for listening, and I hope that we can find a way to fund our program longer. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Thank Good morning. You. Um, my name is Cindy, and um, I have been a resident of Santa Cruz County for almost 10 years. 
I'm also here um, as a concerned member of our community and to share my experience with Second Story um, Peer Respite House. I've been receiving mental health treatment for 18 years and I've been hospitalized 30 times in locked facilities for mental health crises related to being a trauma survivor. I've been a part of the Second Story community for about six months and after a recent crisis and have found an irreplaceable community, hope, healing, and strength within the walls of this respite house. I have also avoided crisis hospitalizations while growing and participating in the Second Story community. I have been able to maintain my housing which, <coughs> while receiving support from my peers, which is not something that is always possible um, in times of extended crisis and hospitalization. Second Story is a unique program in our um, county that truly sees and values each individual that walks through their, its doors and relates to each of us as peers, as equals. This genuine connection fosters agency and one's own healing and recovery. It is one of the only places that I felt so seen, heard, and valued where I am at at any given moment and welcomed into their home, hearts, and minds without judgment. This place of acceptance and transformation has opened up a space to me to begin to share my story and to heal in a long-term sustainable way. As a trauma survivor and a peer, Second Story has made every effort to meet me where I'm at and to help me pave my road in recovery as a valued member of the Second Story community. I do not know what I would do or where I would turn if this respite house was closed and our community was dismantled. Thank you very much for your time and openness to hearing my statement. Thank you. Good morning, thank you for waiting. Hey, my name is Serge Cagno, uh, organizational consultant for homeless services. I think I've met a few of you guys. I think I saw you yesterday at the day services grand opening for Salvation Army in Watsonville. Um, three things, one uh, that I'd like to say, uh, for second story, I deal with a lot of clients who have a really positive uh, experience with it and peer driven things is really a best practice thing. There aren't too many in the county right now. Uh, two other things, uh, homeless action partnership, which I'm a part of. There's also a, there's a main board, there's a general board, there's a executive and there's a governance board. I was wondering if you could look into whether the Brown Act covers those two things. Uh, other counties do have the Brown Act covering their homeless action partnership. so. I'm thinking it's probably just an oversight. Uh, and the County Homeless Coordinating Committee, same thing, I, I think the Brown Act covers that. I was just asking if you'd look into those. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks Hi. for waiting. Carol Williamson from National Alliance on Mental Illness for Santa Cruz County. I've been the volunteer president for 10 years. And what I see is the um, tremendous support we have here for Second Story and holding it um, precious and open to uh, meet the needs that no other program in our county can meet. So not only is uh, Second Story beloved by peers, but I want to speak on behalf of the family members who find it to be their only respite also from being 24-hour caregivers, sometimes um, to someone who might be suicidal or in really dire straits. and. Uh, I have a, mo a single mother who just told me that Second Story is her only respite when her son is suicidal and um, she's too afraid that she can't care for him and he's, he's too um, uh, frightened to go to the hospital. So I hope that you can find the funds to keep Second Story open. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Morning, welcome back. <laughs> Morning. Um, I'm Catherine O'Day with Save Our Shores. I'm going to shift gears here, but first I want to uh, just commend the people who spoke ahead of me, and I was happy to step back and step back in line so that they could speak as a strong group. It does sound like Second Story is a program that should be funded, although that's far outside Save Our Shores wheelhouse. I can't help but comment on that after hearing the passion from these people. <coughs> But I'm here today for the cause of our ocean and our coastal health. 
and just to keep uh, alive and in front of you a letter that we sent to you a, a couple of months ago and then had signed by seven other organizations uh, which is requesting further action on the ubiquitous plastic pollution that has become a crisis in our ocean worldwide. Uh, I'm very pleased to say that there has been interest uh, from a number of you on these issues and I thank you for that and uh, here to uh, support any action that you can take. Um, again, for people in the audience, what we have asked this uh, Board of Supervisors to consider is action on the single-use plastic toiletry bottles uh, in the hospitality industry. We've asked for uh, filters to be mandated for commercial laundry facilities to capture microplastic fibers before they are washed into our waterways and then our ocean. We have asked for consideration of banning the sale of non-recyclable K-cup coffee pods that are thrown into the land waste by the thousands daily uh, and also to look at the potential to uh, ban the sale of single-use water bottles and that would be the sale of water in bottles under a gallon. <clears throat> we realize some of these are more difficult than others but we are ready to support all of them and we know that we have community uh, support for these among our constituents as well as the other constituents. I'd also like to mention that we are looking to add balloons to our list of plastic items for consideration as well as uh, contact lens which we have learned recently are now being flushed down the toilet and also into our waterways and oceans. They in and of themselves are microplastics before they even begin to break down. So I thank you for uh, taking up some of these issues and look forward to working with you on them. Thank you so much. Thank you. Would anybody else like to address us? This is your opportunity. I just want to remind members of the public what it is to be good flag waving Americans because we are good people. I believe that. I believe you guys are good people. Uh, we're able to hear uh, members of the public coming in here and get a feel of the moral impulse of the community from the planes to the mental health issues. All this is, affects me as well. And I would concur with their, their plea because the American public is looking for strong leadership that will show strength of character and moral fortitude to stand up against the corporate powers that would always, w always want the benefit and privilege of government. I want to be able to say this, that the American public, the American public, the praise majority is rising up. And I want to be able to say these are, these are trying times and we do get it. We do get it. And uh, I want to be able to say this, Chairman Friend, I, I want to be able to uh, uh, thank members of the public and, 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 and Gary's Arnold leadership and Becky Steinbrenner's. Uh, Becky Steinbrenner came in here and she divulged that, you know, she emailed a couple of the county board supervisors to try to pull a light item. I thought that was very disrespectful. She did what you guys asked for of her and it, it manifested into nil. Gary Arnold took time to call up the board of the clerk and they refused to pull anything. I want to be able to share with members of the public my uh, imperial experience today. You know, on the fly, I just asked uh, Chairman Friend if I can talk to one of his staff so we can pull one of the light item consent calendars. None of his staff are here, right? I find that very mind boggling. How am I gonna be able to consult with your, with your staff? Uh, how much is the, the American public diverting their income and their labor to support your, your leadership? And yet you can't even have your staff here so I can dialogue with them or make themselves available so I can try to persuade them to pull something off the light item consent calendar to speak on it. Once again, this, is, this goes to show the tyranny of the status quo, that they're receiving all the benefits and privilege of government. The American public is tired of the political shenanigans. We don't want censorship, we don't want devitalization, and we don't want deculturization of our constitutional republic. We wanna come in here as dignified rivals and be able to speak liberating truth to political power. It's imperative, Chairman Friend, that you review uh, the, the conduct of the board because it's a violation of the Brown Act. 
tacoing the consent calendar with the light item, uh, non-consent uh, non items, right, is only uh, uh, convoluting the whole uh, political process. We need the public spirited perspective, people like myself, Gary Arnold, Becky uh, Steinbrenner, and Marilyn, to come in here and illuminate members of the public. Because we want a county, out of the 58 counties, we want one county that's gonna rise and show the American public what it is, that we have a great uh, democracy here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Is anybody else that'd like to address us? Is there anybody beyond this individual who'd like to address us? Thank you. Thank you for waiting. Um, hello, my name is Mary Rawl, and um, I'm very nervous, and I've never, I don't, I don't know if I'm gonna just completely go brain dead, but um, I would like to speak on behalf of Second Story, and I would like to prepare, become better prepared next time with something written so that I can really draw your attention and um, to the importance of not of this program not closing down. So thank you for um, thank you for being here and listening and um, I look forward to seeing you again and hopefully we can work together. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back. Thank you. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. Uh, Benjamin Kogan here. And um, I just wanted to, uh, during open com communication, address my concern. Uh, for the underground uh, water aquifer, how, um, as to my belief, you, the plan is to pump treated sewage water in to uh, prevent the um, drainage of all the water, because if, wa if the water goes down, salt water intrusion is a possibility. Um, and so I actually want to learn how I can be in communication with you and see if there's any other options, like flushless toilets. Uh, my concern is when you pump water in, uh, even though it's treated, there's a possibility of things that we don't know, that we don't know, could be in the water, and so we actually lose our authenticity, our purity, our cleanliness, and um, so I just kind of want to like really be in the conversation with you guys on how to uh, other alternative m alternative measures to, to make a difference for our water supply. Um, so just thought I'd voice that to you guys, um, and maybe I can set up a time to meet with you guys or uh, find out the information and, and learn with you guys. So. Just a concern of mine. Um, well, I got a lot of time. <laughs> normally, normally I take up all the time, but um, so yeah, that, that's been on my mind. Just if if we pump stuff in or do desal, we're gonna not have the fresh water. So how can we think about uh, saving water, conserving water, uh, and and not pumping in treated sewage water and losing our authenticity as Santa Cruz, and then just really figuring out how do we like strengthen the pipelines and and stuff like that. So thank you for your listening on this one. I got t a minute and 20 seconds left. Uh, I yield for your time. Thank you, Supervisor. Thank you. Anybody else like to address us? Okay, uh, seeing none, we will uh, close the public comment period. Uh, Ms. Hall, do you just have uh, one minute to just very briefly say, uh, I think that the discussion on second story is important for my colleagues uh, to be aware that it's a switching of how that will be provided. It's not a, although it's basically from a facility-based to a community-based program, it's not that the services won't be provided, they're being provided in a different way, and I think it's important for the community to be aware of what that plan is. Thank you for being here. Sure, thank you, Chairman Friend. Uh, yes, so I'm not sure how many people are aware of what's actually going to happen. We've worked really, really hard with Encompass to try to figure out how we continue the services, so pure respite as a set of services is not ending. And um, we have a model that we're transitioning to, so effective December 1st, the program will transition to a community and an outreach-based model where we meet people where they are. I know it's not the same thing as how it's been continued before, but we have exhausted every avenue of trying to figure out how to keep the program growing, going in order to save the house. So this is our effort to continue the services, to honor the model of peer respite services, to honor the work that the peers have done as well as the benefit for the community. And um, it was not an option for us to simply completely close things down. So, um, so that is what's going to happen. And for the people who are working in the program currently, 
Um, we have a landing place for all of you. There are seven FTEs, more people than FTEs, and we have a place for all of you to continue the work that you do. Um, and we're saddened just as you are in the closure of the facility, but um, we're looking forward to working with you so that we can continue building this peer-based model in the community um, and meeting people where they are. And uh, we have ideas as well as how we can open up the potential of having facilities and maybe even beds in a different kind of model that's sustainable and affordable. Thank you, Ms. Hall. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, we will now move to the board for the action on the consent agenda. Uh, these are items 8 to 62. Uh, Supervisor Capito, are there any items you'd like to briefly comment on on the consent agenda? Supervisor Caput, if you wouldn't mind, your microphone, I believe, is off. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to see uh, uh, item 55, adopt a resolution authorizing a high f highway safety improvement program grant application. Um, and uh, it's good to see, so thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Kappa. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I do have several items I wanted to uh, comment on. Uh, item number 18, I think this recommendation is the correct one regarding cannabis nurseries. Uh, we need to maintain our ability to, at the local level, to set limits, and I think this is something that is uh, the right decision that was made by our staff. Uh, on item 21, I'm glad to see that uh, the homelessness system performance measures that we're strengthening our outcome measures and comparing our outcome measures comparable to similar counties such as Monterey and San Luis Obispo. And I look forward to getting our report back in October. I'm very pleased to see on item 23, the completion of the Ben Lomond Basketball Court Resurfacing Project. Um, it wasn't a huge project um, and it came in under the engineer's estimate. Uh, it may seem like a small project, but it's gonna mean a lot to the community in the San Lorenzo Valley and particularly Ben Lomond. Uh, on item 35, the uh, probation department caseload, I'm glad to see that, uh, thank you Fernando Geraldo, our chief probation officer for bringing this request to us. Uh, this puts us two positions uh, back that were eliminated to balance, uh, to balance the um, probation department's budget. And it's also uh, important that we reduce the caseload uh, with probation for, uh, to, so we can uh, see, uh, consider how critical those officers are in keeping these folks out of jail. So I do appreciate uh, that effort and I'm glad we we're able to do it. Um, this is something I, we've been waiting for for a long time on item number 52. We, uh, we are able to accept the, the contract for building the Felton Library. And uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Assemblyman Mark Stone for securing a million dollar grant from the state budget for completing this um, first of its type, possibly in the state for a library and park to be combined. Um, and for the, the, uh, the, the general staff for getting the state grant funds. Uh, those two funding streams supplement the Measure S funding that was passed in the library measure four years ago. And thanks for, to our Felton Library friends for all the work that they've done, the Public Works Department, the CAO's office, uh, we're ready to go ahead and reward this bid. Um, and groundbreaking is set for September 21st at four o'clock. Uh, 10 years ago, that library was probably gonna be closed. So uh, it's nice to have it up and running and, and really be a model for uh, the combination of a park and a library. Um, number 53, I uh, was pleased to see the additional $1.4 million in funding from FEMA and the State Emergency Services. Um, this will help us address uh, repairs on six county service areas in the 5th District in particular and uh, throughout the, the area of uh, the county as well. And um, number the finally, number 57, uh, Felton is going to celebrate its 150th birthday. Uh, there's going to be a road closure, and uh, it's going to be a, on uh, on Highway 9. It's going to be a great, great time, October 6th, and we invite everybody to participate. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. 
Hi, good morning. A couple items to add uh, additional direction on. Uh, the first one is item number 21, which is the homeless performance measurements, which we asked for. So it was mentioned in the staff report, but it wasn't in the recommendation that the staff return on October 30th uh, with details on performance measures compared to similar agencies. And then I'd also like to direct that on December 4th, staff will return to the board with additional performance measures, just to make clear that uh, when we'll be getting those, that, that information back. On item number 41, uh, this is the Encompass contract for uh, drug Medi-Cal. Uh, these contracts are for nine months and I'm okay with moving forward with them today. However, the next time uh, when these contracts come up, I'm gonna, I, I ask that the board direct that there be meaningful outcome measures um, uh, in this to, to make sure that we're seeing uh, impacts for the people in need in the community. Uh, on item number 46, on the, which is a CAB contract, I want to take a moment and appreciate uh, HSD and CAB for having meaningful uh, outcomes there so we can really see the results uh, and how we're doing. And then finally on item number 52, which is the Felton Library, I want to congratulate Supervisor McPherson and the, the whole community for really uh, sticking with it on this project to get this important resource available up in Felton. Thank you, good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Just a couple items I'd like to make comments on. On item number 29, um, uh, I encourage our board to take a uh, stand in opposition to U.S. Senate Bill 3157. This board took action last year on a state bill, uh, 569 or 659, uh, that would have taken away any local control over the placement of wireless facilities. Um, this bill uh, 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 is opposed by both uh, our State Association of Counties and the National Association of Counties is taking away uh, local control on land use um, and even limiting the ability to, uh, uh, when uh, corporations use public right-of-ways, uh, to engage in a fair contract. So uh, I hope we will uh, all uh, broadly support this uh, opposition to this bill. On item number 35, uh, I think this is uh, a, a good idea to have this overhire of um, uh, deputy probation officers, uh, this is something that's clearly needed as our system of criminal justice changes and more people are not placed in jail but are under supervision, we need to make, ensure that we have adequate staffing to be able to effectively supervise uh, people who are out of jail. And um, I think this is a good uh, solution. On item number 36, uh, I appreciate that we receive these reports and I appreciate that the percentage of uh, people who are uh, being held in custody before trial has gone down, but we should not accept 66% of our jail population who is being held in our jail but haven't been convicted of anything as an acceptable number. And I encourage um, uh, all of our justice partners to work together uh, to, uh, to continue to bring this number down. Uh, the legislature is currently considering SB 10, uh, which was a bail reform, uh, which could have uh, impact as well. Uh, but I, I think we need to, I appreciate getting the detail in this report, and I think uh, we shouldn't um, be satisfied with the status quo. Uh, we should work uh, to reduce this number even more. Uh, lastly, on item number 41, uh, I'm glad to see that we're using the drug Medi-Cal uh, uh, program uh, to provide millions of dollars of services and increased number of hours for young people who are suffering from substance use disorder. I think this is a, um, a good effort to meet a pressing community need and I'm glad to see you uh, working with a community partner that we can use this new funding resource uh, to provide these services. So thank you for that. That's thank, it. thank you, Supervisor Leopold. Um, I have two brief Comments, I mean, a member of the public had expressed uh, concern on item 19 just regarding the language. I mean, operationally, we would never uh, do it without a board vote, but it strikes me that that's a very simple modification, so I'd suggest that the modification on, on item 19 be that HSD uh, recommend locations for placement as was requested. And I'd also like to add uh, my, my uh, appreciation on, on item 41 for Encompass's work in regards to this, this element and being a strong community partner. I'm glad we're able to use this uh, method to uh, support them. Is there a motion from uh, the board? I Both. move the recommended, uh, I move the consent agenda as amended. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously.
We'll now move on to the regular agenda. We have item six, which is to consider approval and concept of an ordinance amending provisions of the Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 7.130 regulating the cannabis retail industry related to mobile delivery services, restrictions, and signage requirements and schedule final adoption for the next available agenda as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the ordinance amending Chapter 7.130 and the amendments of Chapter 7.130. Ms. Bolster Grant, welcome. Thank you for waiting. Good morning. Thank you, supervisors. Uh, over the past several months, our office has received an increasing number of complaints regarding illegal, non local retail delivery services operating in unincorporated Santa Cruz County. This activity represents unfair competition to our local licensed dispensaries and the resources that they have put into obtaining and keeping those licenses. Our enforcement team is preparing to take aggressive action against these unlicensed businesses, and the proposed amendments to Chapter 7.130 will help in this effort by clarifying the restriction, uh, specifically excluding non-local delivery services. Uh, we are also recommending changes to the signage restrictions contained in uh, 7130, which we believe unnecessarily restrict the size of dispensary signs. Uh, the revision, if approved, would treat dispensary signs the same as other commercial signs in terms of size while maintaining restrictions on the content, including prohibitions on the use of cannabis imagery or other images such as cartoons or toys that could appeal to minors. Therefore, we recommend that your board consider approval in concept of an ordinance amending provisions of Santa Cruz County Code Chapter 7.130, regulating the cannabis retail industry related to mobile delivery service restrictions and signage requirements, and schedule a final adoption for the next available agenda as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. Thank you, are there questions from board members before we open it up to the community? I, I just wanna thank uh, the uh, our licensing office and the fairgrounds uh, for getting together to put this together. Uh, there was an example that didn't go off very well at first, but I think we have uh, a program here that's being um, that's been uh, suggested that um, it, this is a requirement by the by the state. These shows only happen at fairgrounds. So, we'll, fairgrounds. so just is real briefly, Supervisor McPherson, we'll take all of those comments that you just made and apply them to the next item. Oh, <laughs> you jumped. You jumped ahead. <laughs> oh gosh. But uh, no, Sorry. don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. That's okay. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of cannabis being discussed, and so maybe <laughs> yeah. it's having an effect on I, uh, your clarity here. We call but, that a contact hot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> No, so I was looking, at, I was looking, you're at looking straight down. Okay, so are there any other questions on on regarding the uh, 7.130 regarding the cannabis retail industry? If not, uh, we'd like to open it up. Yeah, Supervisor well, I'll just Leopold. say that I I I, I think these okay. are good changes. I think that the um, the signage requirement, the signage changes are also good. But I appreciate that we are keeping the prohibitions, uh, which has been a concern by community members and the community prevention partners. Indeed. But now open it up for the community. Is anybody like to, that would like to address us on item six regarding mobile delivery services and signage requirements? <laughs> right. Good morning. Right, welcome back. Um, I submitted uh, written comments uh, via the website, but I brought some along in case you... And I also included the next item on the agenda in these comments, but I'll just address the uh, two that you're uh, on this agenda item. As far as delivery services, we support the, uh, the notion of a uh, licensed delivery services in the county, local licensed delivery services. We are uh, a little apprehensive, however, about the ability of the county to enforce uh, uh, to take any kind of enforcement action against uh, unlicensed or illegal um, delivery services or licensed outside of the area delivery services. The state is considering uh, legislation or rule changes that would permit license, licensed delivery services to operate in any jurisdiction in the county, I mean in the state. And uh, that would put, um, that, that would create a situation where you have both licensed 
and unlicensed uh, delivery services operating, and the ability to distinguish between the two is going to become more and more difficult. The other uh, thing to consider is that uh, currently about 70% of the population of the state uh, reside in areas where um, there are no uh, retail outlets uh, permitted. So uh, that is a disadvantage for uh, Santa Cruz County cannabis producers. In other words, we're locked out of 70% of, of the state because uh, of these local bans. And, and so we would, uh, while we support a local license for delivery services, we think it might be a better approach to create a local license uh, to identify those people who are licensed by the state to deliver um, and permit them to deliver in Santa Cruz County as well. As far as signage, we, we support the, uh, the uh, bringing cannabis businesses into the same regulations as any other business. We think that makes good sense. Uh, we'd also like you, however, to look at uh, the previous uh, section in that ordinance right before uh, section 11 that uh, prohibits pretty much any kind of advertising uh, that uses a description of the cannabis product. Uh, that we think is uh, too onerous and we also believe it puts local uh, producers at a disadvantage from out of area producers. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning, welcome back. Hello, uh, Pat Malo. Um, just a couple of things the, to clarify what Jim was talking about, about the deliveries, because I think there's some nuances, is that for a long time there has been unlicensed deliveries all throughout California, but in Santa Cruz County. And I know that you've heard from the licensed dispensaries how there's putting them out an unfair playing, you know, on the unfair playing field. And we agree with that 100%. What we're thinking about this, uh, you know, there's been a proposed changes at the state law that level that would allow any licensed delivery service to deliver to any county. And if we are saying that these out of county licensed delivery services can't come into the county to be able to deliver, you know, to customers here, that's great with me. I've never lived anywhere from Santa Cruz. I don't want anyone else making a dime here, right? But the, uh, you know, <clears throat> the issue is the, those two things are different issues. And I think that the, re the real solution to this is that we might have trouble preventing those licensed deliveries from out of the county coming here. I think it's a much better idea to require them to pay our CBT tax if they're gonna do deliveries here, putting them at a situation where they're probably paying their local tax as well as ours when they're doing deliveries. Um, I think that's different because I think that you're gonna have a really hard time going after these licensed delivery services who are delivering to Santa Cruz County um, and it's a much different task than unlicensed businesses in, you know, in general. So Thank thanks, you. just want to clarify that. Appreciate it. Good morning and welcome back. Thank you all for waiting. Um, good morning, my name is Jenna Shankman. As you know, um, I come with the lens of um, youth cannabis use prevention, specifically environmental prevention strategies which will create a healthy environment for youth in Santa Cruz County. Um, I came specifically to make sure that uh, in the signage code we retained, um, not including cannabis imagery, so I'm really um, excited to hear that that's going to be the case. Um, it's really great news that the state is continuing to strengthen cannabis advertising regulations, but in Santa Cruz County, we still have stronger advertising regulations. Um, so I want to, um, it makes sense that our signs would also follow those. Um, we have these restrictions because youth are particularly prone to influence of advertising symbolism and brand recognition. And I know our uh, local dispensaries work hard um, as responsible community oriented businesses, but it helps to have this clarifying um, language um, present and there is 
also a precedent um, who took a look and saw in Washington State they um, they have those restrictions at the statewide level of not having cam cannabis imagery, imagery and other things. And um, also I want to um, comment on the strength in language about non-local deliveries. Um, we wrote a letter about this in the past and believe it will reduce youth access for these services which may not follow the same strong local standards that are tied to our local licensing system, so I think that this um, movement towards greater enforcement of delivery services and um, looking at how they operate and kind of staying to the strict standard of allowing delivery only for our um, brick and mortar businesses um, is wise. So thank you always for your constant balance of um, different community needs, looking at uh, business, youth prevention, and public health. Thank you, Mr. Eichmann. Welcome back. All right, great to be back, thank you. Okay, so we lost one. <laughs> um, so my concern uh, to is, you know, um, uh, dis 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 distribution of, uh, of cannabis has been going on since, ever since I've been a kid from writing California. And my question is, um, what is the punishment system that's put in place? Because there's always going to be legal and illegal um, deliveries. And so there's a portion of our youth that get caught up in this. There's a portion of other businesses and all this. And then what role does kind of, uh, you know, um, freedom kind of have to play in just letting people be fully self-expressed and being able to kind of just choose the lifestyles they want to live. And so my concern is that like this puts more people in prison, more fines, it's more regulatory action and could cause um, uh, maybe just more, more disruption. And maybe there's a, a, a convenient or better way that we can work together. So I'm, I'm learning with you guys, I appreciate you guys, you know, Taking, taking the actions that you know, you're taking, and I just wanted to voice what came to me. Thank you, guys. This will be our final speaker. Yeah, I, I just want to be able to, to remind members of the public that when you're being asked this trip and you can't sleep because the planes are flying over, and you know, you're having a difficult time even coming in here and weighing in on the political issue, it's important that we have uh, licensed uh, delivery services, even coming from the adjacent counties, right? We need to open it up so it's fair competition. That's what free enterprise is all about. I want to be able to say this, that, you know, most members of the public that you do use cannabis, right? And remember, I do suffer from PTSD. I can't get treatment at the mental health services. Having a nice delivery service that I'm able to have a rapport with is important. Right? Free enterprise allow other people that are having a good system, delivering 24-7, it's a good thing, right? Taxing them, making it hard, is just more privilege, right? Just for, for this, uh, Santa Cruz County. We want to open up so other people can be able to enjoy that. Thank you. Thank you. That closes public comment, and I'll bring it back to the board and hand it back over to our chair. Are there any additional questions or comments, or a motion would be appropriate at this time. I would uh, move the, r the recommended action. Second. We have a motion from Supervisor Leopold, a second from Supervisor Coonerty. Supervisor Leopold, additional comments? Yeah, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to work with Ms. Galloway to make sure I be clear in my, uh, <laughs> my motions. Uh, one thing we've uh, s uh, seen is uh, this question about uh, delivery services. Um, there is a bill in the California legislature right now, 1302, uh, that would allow delivery services anywhere in uh, California. I've written a letter to, uh, against this legislation because while there might be some areas which uh, don't have any services and uh, don't have any dispensaries, here in Santa Cruz, we, we have worked very hard to have a uh, fully regulated and I think successful system of uh, retail uh, sales uh, for cannabis. And I think that the delivery services uh, threatens to upset the, that, that um, well thought out legislation. And so I think, uh, uh, I didn't bring it to the board today because I thought the bill might already be voted on by the time it got here. But uh, I think that, uh, that enforcing our regulations against delivery services is important. The other thing that I'll just point out, and 
uh, supporting the work of uh, community prevention partners. And good news is it was in today's Sentinel is that uh, cannabis use among teenagers has actually gone down according to surveys uh, since legalization, uh, not gone up. And this is, uh, this is uh, we've seen this in other states. I think only Alaska is a state which saw a, a modest bump up, but uh, Colorado has been, uh, has been uh, no more than steady uh, since 2014, and uh, in Washington it's gone down. So uh, it's interesting to see how legalization has affected or not affected uh, uh, use uh, in California, uh, but I support these efforts. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Opposed? It passes unanimously. We'll move on. Thank you for that. We'll move on to item seven, which is to consider a status report on uh, cannabis licensing office operations, adopt resolution regarding temporary cannabis events located at the county fairgrounds, and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the CAO. We have the letter from the fairground CEO, the draft sample authorization letter, a draft cannabis special events application form, a draft cannabis special events tax form, and the resolution, resolution for temporary cannabis events. Ms. Bolster Grant, thank you for waiting. No problem. Um, so this is the first regular status update on the non-retail commercial cannabis licensing program following the adoption of the implementing ordinances in May of this year. Uh, our update will also include a discussion of the request for authorization of special cannabis events at the county fairgrounds. Uh, so when the ordinances took effect on June 8th, our office created the forms and procedures uh, necessary to begin the use permit and licensing application process. That process begins with a pre-application consultation. Uh, this consultation allows our staff to review the commercial cannabis development proposals and meet with the planning department to make sure that we have consistency in the application of our new ordinances and policies that everybody's still uh, trying to understand. Uh, as of this morning, we've had 20 pre-application consultations come in and one discretionary permit application which has been submitted to the planning department. Uh, this first application, I'd like to note, is um, would actually allow up to 20 uh, prospective uh, manufacturing licensees uh, of edible products to operate in a shared commercial kitchen. So this one permit um, has, has the potential to benefit many different businesses uh, locally. As the cannabis industry and the regulatory agencies become more familiar with the new ordinances and permitting process, we expect a steady uptick in the permitting activity over the next few months. Uh, the other major program update is enhanced enforcement action. Based on complaints from the general public, referral from our partner agencies, and proactively identifying cannabis cultivation, specifically using aerial imagery, the licensing office staff has now responded to 55 potential violations of the ordinances. Of those, nearly half have been resolved, the majority through voluntary uh, compliance by removing plants, um, and in some cases, small manufacturing equipment. Uh, a few of those have been determined to be uh, non-commercial medical grows, and uh, we've posted three uh, notices of violation for folks that were not uh, able to come into compliance. The remaining unresolved complaints are largely uh, registrants who are in our system. Um, they're either preparing to apply for their permits or they are still in the process of trying to find compliance sites. And we have given uh, a date of June 2019 for all registrants to find a site uh, which uh, meets their needs that complies with our ordinance. Um, so there is some safe harbor that we've talked about in the past for folks who uh, have every intention of coming into compliance um, but have not yet found a place where they can do that. Um, on August 13th, two sheriff's deputies uh, joined our office and in short order they have accompanied our investigators on visits to all of our licensed dispensaries and to many cultivation and manufacturing sites around the county. They have been invaluable in helping to uh, identify and investigate potential violations, performing background checks, and ensuring safe site inspections. Um, and they're also part of our education effort because enforcement really in many cases is about uh, educating both the public and the industry about what our rules are and how we are implementing them. Uh, an issue that was not on our radar when we formulated our licensing program uh, is the issue of temporary cannabis events. 
and the state recently added regulations creating a separate license type for such events, which allows the, for the sale and consumption of cannabis and cannabis products on county fairgrounds, subject to authorization by local jurisdictions. Uh, the issue was brought to our attention following an event that was held at the fairgrounds this past spring uh, without our knowledge or authorization. Um, as a result of that event, we met with the fairground manager and discussed a process that would allow future events with a number of safeguards to ensure compliance with state and local laws and payment of our cannabis business tax. Uh, in addition to payment of taxes, our operational conditions include different security measures, uh, insurance uh, requirements, and so forth. Uh, we believe that subject to these operational conditions, temporary events could create an economic benefit to the county, uh, certainly the fairgrounds, um, and also promoting the local cannabis industry, and uh, we are supportive of providing authorization for these events. Uh, with that, uh, we recommend that your board consider the status report on cannabis licensing office operations, adopt the resolution regarding temporary cannabis events located at the county fairgrounds, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the county administrative officer. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for that report. We'll start first with board questions and open it up to the community. We'll start with Supervisor Caput. Good morning. You bet. Thank you. I, I want to thank you for all the work you've done in the last uh, month, uh, actually putting the, putting all of this uh, together. And uh, I want to thank uh, the fair uh, board also for stepping forward and being f so cooperative. Uh, that would be uh, Mr. Kagebein and the, uh, uh, the board of the, uh, the fairgrounds. Uh, now I, I'm going to check off some stuff that I wrote. Um, when I think of the uh, fairgrounds, I think of variety. I think of uh, the Friday night races. Uh, I think of uh, circuses to come to town. I think of Little League Baseball that's uh, located out there on the fairgrounds too. Equestrian uh, events, horses and uh, everything. And then also the fair itself. So. <clears throat> what I'm getting here, uh, taxpayers uh, in general pay for everything, and it's how we spend taxpayer money is what's important. So their taxpayers in the past created fairs and fairgrounds and all that. So I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of what we're going forward here. I guess what I, okay, we're talking about four events. Are we talking about four weekends or four days? Uh, four separate events, uh, uh, either two or three days per event is how, how we propose this. Okay, so we're talking actually about uh, up to 16 days, possibly? I think 12 days 12. total. Is it 12? I think that's how it's written. I can check again. But I believe uh, that okay. we accommodated okay. for long weekends. I'm sorry if I'm um, misstating that, uh, but You're I thought right. that okay. it was two or three days. So a weekend or a long weekend, I think. Okay, and the, I guess the concern I have, and we can even uh, yeah. maybe allow Mr. Kagebein to make a comment too. Uh, what I don't want to see is uh, uh, this becoming a cash cow where it makes a lot of money and then it becomes a priority and then it affects everything I've, I mentioned in variety. Uh, okay, ba Little League Baseball is not making any money out there. Okay, so the event comes in. Are, are they going to get bumped out or are we going to start, you know, moving? Will it go beyond four, uh, four events? Will it be f up to four events? And what if, uh, what if it doesn't go well? Uh, are we able to say what only two or maybe three or, uh, what's our authority up here? If right. that's directed <laughs> at me. Um, I, we're trying We're trying for it. We're starting out with four events. Um, anything uh, beyond what we've outlined here would need to come back to your board for authorizing more uh, conceivably. Yeah. But as a point of clarification, Thank it's you. up to four events. Correct. Those events uh, would need to still be approved mm -hmm. by, uh, well, I guess your position technically moving forward. You will be missed. Uh, and uh, the board always has the ability to review, revoke, reduce, or increase 
uh, moving forward and uh, the fair, as you know, books out quite a distance in advance, fairgrounds do, so there aren't necessarily that many available weekends as it stands. So it's, it's an authorization of up to four, but there's also a reality that four might uh, not even be possible uh, in a given year based on their, their calendar. Okay, uh, up to four, but uh, what, it could go beyond four if we if, were able if, to change if we, it? If we decided to change it, yes. Okay, that's the, that's the concern I have. Uh, I'd like to have a number and uh, make it. You do it have a number. You do have a number. So number. what we'd be approving today is up to four. It would require the board, something to come back to the board to amend uh, this action to make it more than four. Uh, in the future, should that be something that we desire. But I think that there's also a reality here that, that four is an unlikely high number for how the fair uh, schedules uh, in advance. This is just the possibility that at some point it would be up to four in a year. All right. And then the other would be, we're talking about outside vendors. Uh, when we say outside, can they be, can, that's any county in California that they come from? Licensed retailers, so right. folks that have uh, obtained state York? license. Can there, somebody from New York? No, so they would not qualify for a license from the state. Th that's clear in the resolution, it is? Okay. And then, uh, uh, then uh, in variety also events, rentals, how they would be, uh, how they would be affected. Uh, the, the concern I have, and uh, Mr. Kagebein, if we could ask him, uh, you're, you're doing a great job out there. Uh, we trust you, but then uh, what I'm getting at is uh, down the line, uh, somebody else you know, takes over years from now. I, I, don't, I just don't wanna see um, money and one particular thing that makes so much money affecting all the variety of the fairgrounds. Maybe you can answer that, is that okay? Please, Mr. Kegman. Thank you for being here this morning. Good morning, Dave Kegabine, CEO of the Santa Cruz County Fair. Um, currently, you know, our schedules typically, we, we don't book events more than a year out. We have a lot of regular ongoing events that happen annually. And then we fill in the schedule with weddings, quinceaneras, um, private parties, um, a variety of different things. So our our current plan going forward we have three potential weekends next year where we could do an event if we you know figured out the proper way and we get them licensed and we're able to move forward our thought process is perhaps two events a year one in the spring and one in the fall um, but we don't want to be coming back to the board of supervisors every month asking for something different so we put it out as four potential events um, so some years down the road perhaps I don't look at this particular business uh, pushing out any other business we do. Um, you know, we're looking at, we, we have certain events that regularly happen on certain months every year and have for a long time. We continue to try to add new events um, in those categories. So I understand your concerns. I think most events will probably be two days. Um, and there might, you know, I'm looking around at other events that are conducted throughout the state, and there's a lot of one-day events, too, that make good sense. So it's quite possible they could turn into one-day events. Okay, so let's say they had, uh, you had another event, let's say uh, Little League Baseball playoffs or something. Uh, would that be affected if, uh, if uh, something was scheduled like this on that weekend? Well, our Little League, we have a, a singular Little League field, so all um, sort of playoffs competitions and stuff are done at other fields in the community. And w we kind of have a unique situation in the Little League in that all other Little League fields throughout Santa Cruz County are supported through taxpayer funds. And the Little League field at the fairgrounds, um, we, we're in the situation where we have to charge some rent and Little League has to pay for, for the utilities, the water and that sort of thing because we don't have that gov government subsidy to support that. So our single Little League field uh, is not going to be impacted by these events. Their season, you know, potentially a springtime event might be on a weekend. Um, we might have to make a little adjustment to their schedule, but we're not gonna push them out. Um, and their season ends in June. Um, potential events in July or October would not impact Little League. And uh, I guess uh, maybe in a way too, the, the revenue that you get from the uh, 
a cannabis event uh, would be able to keep other programs actually running? Well, as hopefully everyone knows, the um, Fairgrounds is a, an unsubsidized or unfunded agency that lives on its own economic generation. So it's um, just like an airport or some of these other economic enterprises, we operate based on the revenues we can generate. So in the last, um, well, I'm, I'm about to undertake my seventh fair, and in the last seven years we have really restructured, reorganized, rebuilt a lot of different things with the revenues we can generate. So we're simply looking at, uh, we have an aging facility purchased in 1935. We were just talking earlier about our buildings that are built, built in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s with all the same infrastructure issues you're dealing with in the county on a much smaller scale, but no taxpayer funding to pay for those repairs. So we're simply looking for the opportunity to try new things, do different things, um, serve all the different aspects of our community. Right, and I realize some don't make money, so what I'm looking at, and I do trust you, uh, is that money that comes from this actually does help to keep the fair open and allow the variety of other events that are taking place there. Correct. Amen. And uh, the, the last concern I have is, uh, and this is a, a little bit unrelated, but I've seen this happen with uh, different things. When you have so much cash, there's a tendency to want to get more and more and more. Uh, so four events, maybe what, maybe five, maybe six, maybe 10. I, I don't want to see a cash cow uh, take over the fairgrounds uh, in the future. So I've seen it happen with, uh, we'll, we'll just, for example, I've seen in the past, uh, maybe a veterans building, and pretty soon there's so many events in there that on Veterans Day, uh, veterans one time in Watsonville couldn't have an event because there was something scheduled that was making more money than they, you know, that they were going to be able to do. So I, what I'm getting at is all of these things that you do, the wonderful things that you do at the fair, uh, hopefully cannabis will fit in with it, not take it over, but actually help it out. So we're currently doing about 400 events a year annually at the fairgrounds. Okay. So if we do four of these events, we're talking about 1% potentially of our total overall different diverse business. Right. I'd, I'd, I'd like, uh, I'm for it. I just want to make sure it doesn't become, uh, it doesn't affect all of a sudden next year we talk to you and it's, we had four cannabis events and only 250 other events instead of 400. Okay, but I think I made my point and uh, I trust you. Uh, 400 events is because of the hard work you're doing out there at the fairgrounds, thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Supervisor Cavett. Supervisor Leopold. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just had uh, a couple questions about some of the uh, aspects of the report and, and one of the conditions. Um, First of all, uh, I think the state legislature uh, uh, put in uh, the, this rule or the, uh, the uh, regulatory agency as a way of supporting fairgrounds um, and uh, made that a smart choice. It's, it's uh, uh, and uh, in meeting with uh, fairground board members, uh, it was clear how serious they are about this to be well managed um, and they have a great history of doing that and so uh, I'm glad to see this uh, happening, uh, and I approve this process. Uh, there, there was one part which didn't completely make sense to me, and I just wonder if you could clarify. On the conditions, um, number 19, it says no weapons of any kind. Well, that, I, I strongly support that. And then, then it says included but not limited to guns, knives, or so it seems okay, and then, then it has drug paraphernalia. Um, and I'm wondering uh, how broadly that covers, I mean, first of all, I don't know why that would be under weapons, but, uh, uh, but trying to figure out what that, I mean, it's a cannabis event, or rolling papers or pipes, part of that, or? I, I, not so much, probably rolling papers, I think, but, you know, it's something that could be construed as a weapon and maybe paraphernalia not related to cannabis, um, but giant pipe sort of things. Well, I, I mean, the, the, uh, uh, it's, uh, I've been in a couple of these um, 
uh, dispensaries. I have a number of them in my district, and so I see what they sell, and there are pipes, there are uh, different vaporizers, there are water pipes. Um, all seem to be uh, connected to, this, to the sale of the product. Um, are they not going to be allowed in, in, in something like this? I mean, they're not weapons unless someone breaks the water pipe and uses the, uh, the glass. I would agree with that. I okay. would not consider most paraphernalia to be a weapon. Um, and, and I'm not 100% sure. I'm, I'm sort of trying to check the state to see if that language uh, mimics uh, anything in the, in the state ordinance. Um, you will be able, my understanding, to buy paraphernalia, anything that's associated, but bringing in your own, I think, was was the object. Um, why it's lumped in with weapons, I, I don't have a great answer. Well, I mean, I, I'm just, what I'm trying to get a yep. sense, and maybe I look to a council, is people, there are associated products, let's just say, uh, 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 to cannabis. Are, does this prevent those from being sold, or is it? Um, no, it's to prevent them from being brought in and forcing people to buy what's being provided there. You can't enter with a weapon. You can't enter with your own with your giant own pipe. bong. You I see. Bong, yes. But you can purchase them inside. Right. All right. That's, that's, that's a lot clearer. But, uh, I will uh, let people know not to bring their water pipes uh, uh, to the event. Uh, the other question I had had to do with the enforcement uh, piece, mm -hmm. uh, which is, um, uh, during the course of discussions, we heard a lot about environmental deg degradation mm -hmm. um, and uh, hundreds of, of uh, uh, complaints. And I'm trying to get a sense, are, uh, I, I don't know where all those stand, it's now been a couple of years, uh, but do we really not have that many complaints that we have to go out and look for uh, uh, more complaints? I mean, we have a planning department that is, is a complaint driven, we don't go out and look for problems. So it's, when I hear about aerial uh, photography, I'm, I'm trying to think of, are we really that, that short of complaints that we need to do that? No, I think that we we promised the community enhanced uh, and, and uh, robust enforcement. Um, there was certainly and, and still some, some skepticism about our um, ability to take enforcement seriously. And um, I think there, there are other issues about why people don't report complaints, but, but part of the discussion that we've had all along was uh, that we wanted to identify particularly um, environmentally uh, injurious kinds of, of groves, of which there are tons, and, and your board has heard, heard presentations on those in, in, over the past years. Um, so we don't want to necessarily wait for complaints when we know that somebody is, is chopping down a bunch of trees or, or doing a lot of clearing. So they go hand in hand. What is interesting to me so far is the majority of uh, the complaints and, and responses to, to our efforts um, tell me that there are lots of folks out there who really want to comply, even if they're associated with uh, some, some actions that we're not supportive of in the past, people are coming in and being very responsive to direction that's coming from our office and, and lining up to make their applications, trying to figure out um, what the rules are and how they fit to them. Um, but there's still a lot of bad stuff out there and, and some of it is, is not able to be easily reported by citizens and, and not able to be uh, identified in any other way other than looking at our aerial photography. Um, but we go through the, the same basic steps of trying to contact folks and bring them into compliance. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I support the, the, uh, the, uh, all the pieces here. Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, let me repeat myself. You know, it's, uh, excuse, uh, sorry about that for being premature, but first of all, I wanna thank Robin Bolstergrant for the tremendous job that she has done in implementing our cannabis ordinances in this county. I mean, I think we have, it's been a long process, and you were here when we've really had to face some, well, really make the decisions. And uh, if with your leadership and r recommendations and all, it's really been a pleasure to work with you. I'm sorry to see you go. I know we all are as cannabis licensing officer, but um, congratulations on your future in the, in the courtrooms and on the right side of the courtroom. But uh, I, I just wanted to uh, 
also thank the fairgrounds for, uh, they, they had an event and there were short, shortcomings that they really weren't aware of, I don't think, and it's pretty clear that they said, hey, okay, we didn't know that and we're gonna step up the plate and meet your recommendations. So I'm, I really wanna thank the fairgrounds for its uh, proactive efforts in this area. Uh, as far as the shows go themselves, and I'm, it's hard for me, it's difficult for me to see exactly how they're staging, but I'm sure some, there's gonna be a main door or a couple doors. Is there any kind of a local preference that we can give to our uh, local growers? Uh, I think that would be, if it's, if it's allowable, I think it would be a really good thing. It'd be, be uh, a benefit to uh, our local growers and our, and our county tax base for, as a matter of fact, possibly too. Is that possible? Yes. Um, we have uh, included that in, in the, the wording and the uh, fairgrounds uh, also has concluded that in, in their response that local uh, retailers would be given um, uh, locational preferences to some degree but invited to, to every event for sure. Very good, I'm supportive of the measure. Uh, thank you, we'll now open, uh, Supervisor Coonerty, did you have something? No, go ahead. Okay, we'll now open it up for the community. If there's anybody that uh, like to address us on this item, now is your opportunity. Appreciate everybody waiting on this item. Yeah, th uh, thank you. I think this is a good thing. I do appreciate your guys' leadership, and I want to be able to thank the fairgrounds for their innovation and in finding creative ways to sustain the uh, the fairgrounds. Because I want to be able to share with members of the public, Santa Clara County Fairgrounds, it, it, it's poorly managed and it's uh, it's on the verge of just going out of business because they're afraid to adapt to the changing times. Uh, the, uh, the, the human society, right, th this is a need and a want that many members, just like drinking some good wine and eating some nice cheese, right, people want to be able to go to a festival and enjoy that, you know, the cannabis. I'm part of the, uh, the cannabis community, you know. Dealing with my PTSD, I, I drink C CBD water, right, I use a lot of the products and I even smoke uh, the cannabis and I enjoy it. So I'm looking forward and be able to participate in this spend my hard-earned dollars and to support this. It's a good thing, right? We have to have the moral courage to try things and, and bring healing to the community. And this is one of the ways, thank you. Hi, uh, Pat Malo again. Um, so I'm very, very happy about this event license. I went to the, um, you know, the unofficial one that was happening under you guys' noses and was really disgusted because I've been, you know, our growers locally five years ago were, you know, saying, well, we need a farmer's market. We need direct access to, you know, our patients, um, similar to organic foods. And this, I've, and we were told, you know, that's one of the reasons we can't take you, you guys seriously is <laughs> because you want a farmer's market. And now we've come here and we've got, you know, a licensing, um, possibility for these four events and this could be a lifesaver for local cultivators if they're able to be able to go direct to customers because this is our biggest challenge that we're facing right now with our local you know cultivators manufacturers is there is a lack of shelf space available to them in um, you know Santa Cruz County but there's a lack of shelf space throughout the state and so if we can provide another avenue for our local businesses to be able to provide directly to their consumers now that is going to go a long way in making sure that we still have small businesses here um, the organics food movement never ever would have gotten on Safeway's shelf until they were able to go direct and build that market their same um, you know so and just to clarify we have we have an ordinance and because of the state rules in order to be able to sell at this event you're gonna have to have a retail license so the 12 local retailers and all the other out-of-town retailers would be available to go or you're gonna need a micro business license which allows you to do you know, manufacturing, cultivate, small manufacturing, small cultivation, and be able to have a, a retail license in that you're able to, you know, potentially have a dispensary. But if you were able to use this as your retail, these events, then we would be able to have actual growers, um, you know, participating at this thing. Um, that might be a little complex about all these things. All I'm saying is that we have opened up the door for that 
consumer direct model, and that's a big deal. There's still a couple of steps that we're gonna have to take as far as getting these local cultivators to band together under a retail license or a micro business license so that they could even attend these events and, and offer their products there. Um, and then one last thing while I've got 17 seconds is that there, we're so happy that there is something about local business preference in this, but we want local promoter preference as well because I can easily see a situation where out of town financed folks come in and sell out of town wheat at the fairgrounds again. Thank you. Mr. Malo, uh, how much is the micro business license that you mentioned? Oh, how much uh, does uh, it? How, how much does the state charge for that? I think that they, it is substantially cheaper than a retail license. I wanna say $10,000, but that might be completely, well that's, amazingly cheap in the world of expensive <laughs> cannabis, which is another problem. I mean, my joke, well, I'm completely off the time scale, is that all of my friends have lost their jobs, they just don't know it yet, and now they're starting to know it. We had thousands and thousands of businesses here, and now we have 15 people who have started Thank a pre-application process. You. But that's uh, mainly because of the high state fees, not because of the... Yeah, I mean, we've, we've had uh, major, major issues with a lot of the state things, local, local things we're getting there on our own timeline, and that's getting better, so. Okay. Thank well, you, mainly the state. Thank you. Welcome back. So, Jim Coffus again, and um, I'm not. I, I do support the event license. I would. Uh, I urge you to actually consider more than four events. I don't think there's any reason to limit the number. If there are, if there's interest, they should be. Uh, we should consider them. But I'm going to speak uh, specifically to the reporting that uh, Robin did, and, and I want to also echo uh, Supervisor McPherson's comments about uh, our own notorious uh, RBG, who we're going to miss uh, tremendously, and we wish her the best. Um, I'm very happy that the board has requested and that the CLO has provided a report. Yeah, I think that this is something that the board should, uh, particularly at the onset of this, uh, should be uh, stay in touch with to know what's going on. Uh, I'm a little sad that uh, some information was missing from this report. For instance, uh, uh, retail cannabis uh, tax revenue it has been down for the last three quarters. I think that might be a reflection on the uh, uh, tax rate that uh, I would hope you uh, would take into consideration and maybe bring back and discuss in the future. Um, I'm encouraged, uh, we were encouraged by the inclusion of the cottage license in the non-retail cannabis ordinance, but unfortunately, um, we're not seeing too many of those uh, applications be submitted. Um, and I'd be curious why we think that's happening. Likewise, uh, I, I noticed uh, the consent agenda item about the nursery license where uh, the recommendation is to maintain the status quo and not to create a specialty nursery license like the state has. Um, I would urge you to reconsider that. I think that the reason you don't have uh, more interest in the nursery license at the local level is because uh, people see it as uh, not viable. And until we create a license type that uh, speaks to the need of, of nurseries, uh, you won't get any. Uh, finally, I think that the, um, I was kind of dismayed by both agenda items, I notice that now uh, all agenda items or, or action items uh, reference the uh, strategic plan. And in neither of these items is economic vitality mentioned. And, and I think until the board and the, and the county begins to look at cannabis as an economic development issue, we're going to keep running into roadblocks. And I, I really would urge you to begin to try and focus on local cannabis as a economic Thank driver. You. Thank you. Thank you. Good 
morning, Becky Steinbrenner, resident of rural Aftos. Um, Ms. Bolstergren, I'd like to thank you for your good report and I'm gonna miss you too. I know you to be a very fair and trustworthy person and I wanna thank you for your good service to our community. Um, in the vein of the agreement with County Fair, I, I support the County Fairgrounds. I've spent a lot of time out there with my kids over the years and I really support the good work they're doing. Um, I would like to know that um, there's some sort of notification to youth groups who may have a 4-H workday or an equestrian event um, to let them know when these cannabis events are gonna happen so we don't have to worry about the youth getting into trouble or getting the vendors into trouble or anything like that. So I would like to ask that that happen. Um, I would also point out that really this is no different than um, a, a wine and beer tasting event that happens all over the county and in fact at um, the rural level many events um, are being licensed with commercial license out in the rural areas to have wine tasting events. So this is really no different um, and we need to really look at it differently than perhaps we have in the past. And consider um, looking at uh, something similar to the community supported agriculture um, packages that people can buy, um, getting door service of organic produce every week. That that could be allowed for the cannabis people too. Um, I'd like to address uh, the report that Ms. Bolster Grant gave in general in my neighborhood, um, the Redwood Cathedral Canyon early this month, there was a huge um, bust <laughs> that when I learned about it, it was shocking. It was the largest um, marijuana and uh, honey oil extraction bust in the county. It took them, the officials three days to clean up and um, three tons of material were removed with guns and $40,000 worth of extraction equipment. This is in a rural neighborhood. This is next to an outdoor education science camp that f every week, every weekend holds host youth groups. And it is in a wooded area that has uh, had red flag fire conditions. It is in a condi an area that has a box canyon with one way in, one way out, and next to Nicene Mark State Park. So I want to again point out that it's difficult for the public. It was brought to the attention by a concerned public member. Often out in there, people see things going on and they don't speak out because they don't know if it's legal or not. So we need to come up with some way to make it easier and to encourage the public to thank report you. these kinds of dangerous activities. Thank you. And thank you again, Ms. Bolster Grant. Good morning, thank you for waiting, welcome back. Thank you, good morning. Um, shout out to Hawaii Little League. Yeah. They needed it after the storm, so I, uh, I love Little League and, and uh, I'm really happy for that community. I uh, am very um, happy that the fairgrounds has, uh, is working together to bring these sort of events. Um, what I'm not so happy about is the continued ignor uh, ignoring of the small heritage cultivators in our county. And I think that this might be a wonderful way to help those that are suffering. Uh, you know, this has been and will continue to be a huge economic impact uh, for the small cultivators in the county, including myself. Um, I happily registered. I wanted to be a part of uh, cannabis becoming legal and moving forward. I paid my taxes. Uh, I don't happen to be in the right zoning. I have a small medical garden, but the ability to sell excess helped me pay my mortgage and my taxes. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to continue doing that because as of January 1, I have nowhere to sell my excess cannabis. So as I heard you say before, you know, part of your board's um, responsibility is to continue looking at how things are going, whether they are impacting. Trust me, you trust the fairground people, 
I, I'm, I'm, I'm a trustworthy person. Cannabis is not a cash cow for most people. We're just paying our rent, paying our mortgage, paying our taxes, and supporting our families. We need to get back to uh, gathering in as many people as we can. That, that I think is really important. And I know it's a process. I'm gonna keep coming up here and advocating for the smaller grower. That means, and I'm so happy that the cottage license was included. That was something that I have worked hard for, but we need to have more tiers to that. We need to, we need to bring the people in that we said we were gonna bring in. What happened to that? It's, it's a smaller grow is better than all these larger ones. And we need to keep working towards finding a way to have that happen. We need, get, need to get rid of the biases. And so I wanna work with you and I will continue to come here and advocate for the smaller heritage farmers in the county. Thank you. Morning, welcome. Good morning, board. Don Dietrich, uh, Santa Cruz County uh, Fair Board, uh, as our CEO said, uh, we are an unfunded state agency. And uh, our goal is to provide, our mission is to provide a safe place for community events and educational opportunities. That's what we do. As board members, we uh, provide vision and oversight to make sure that we're providing a variety of things for the community to come and enjoy. Uh, and we try and keep the doors open, we do do that uh, 365 days a year. The fair is an event that happens at the fairgrounds. It's a big event and it generates about 60% of our revenue. The rest of it is generated through the rental business where we rent out our buildings and our grounds for people to come there and enjoy and use the open space and the buildings that we have. So in, in that vein, um, I think what I can assure you, Mr. Caput, is there's nine of us that sit on that board and we've had very spirited debates about whether or not we wanted to be involved in issues surrounding the cannabis business. Before the state made the regulation where the fairgrounds is the place that has to host these events, we were in some sort of a, a declining mode to have those kind of events at the fairgrounds. Now that that's the place where these people can come and gather, we do have a responsibility pro to provide those events for the community. And I wanna thank each of you that met with us and talked to us about this because it was very important for, for us to understand what the county has gone through, it's thoughtful and ardent process to come to what I consider to be good public policy on how to regulate the cannabis business. And we wanna follow those rules. Uh, we're not necessarily looking to, to turn this into a cash cow, but to provide another kind of event for people from the community to come to enjoy and supplement our income because we do have to generate our own revenue to keep the facility open. And there are a lot of people that rely on us to do that. Uh, there's private parties, as Mr. Kegabine said, he's done a good job of opening it up to diversity and to providing 400 events a year, both public and private, for people to come and use state-owned property. And that's really what we're there for to do. So once again, I really appreciate all of you taking the time to speak to us, to educate us about cannabis in Santa Cruz County and the thoughtfulness that you put into your ordinances and we're happy to follow along with those. Thank you. Thank uh, you. One question. Uh, briefly, Supervisor Caput, uh, Mr. Uh, Dietrich. The cannabis event, uh, the marijuana event, uh, it brings in more money than any other event? No. Uh, other than the fair itself? No, uh, the cannabis events will be a rental opportunity that, and the reason that it works for us is in selective weekends where we have those that happen a couple a year, two, three a year, is that you rent the entire building structure structures, there's uh, you know four primary buildings there that are rental buildings to one person and so what happens is it takes us less staff time to prepare and unprepare when people leave those buildings for the next people. So in a sense, the reason it does, it, it's uh, um, attractive to us is because one, it provides an opportunity for something different at the fairgrounds. And number two, that we can secure those buildings away from everything else. Uh, we do that, you know, uh, through fencing and other things and security so that um, 
all the buildings are rented to one, one person, one promoter, and we deal with one promoter to deal with the facilities. Uh, when you have four different events occurring in four different buildings on a weekend, and sometimes multiple events on a weekend, what happens is everybody needs different things. It takes more staff to prepare those buildings for rental. It also takes more staff to then clean them up for the next building. Sometimes we have events where a building's rented on a Friday night and it's rented on a Saturday night, and then we have to turn those buildings over. So if you have a two-day event at the fairgrounds with one person renting all the buildings, what happens is we don't have to engage that much staff time into preparing the buildings and turning them over for the next people that are coming in. So I don't, wouldn't say that it's going to be the cash cow because we rent all of our facilities and we rent them year round. Our horseshoe facilities, our buildings, the lawn area, the racetrack, all of those things generate the revenue that we use for our general funding. Uh, uh, the last one that was held though brought in quite a bit of money, right? Uh, I don't, I can off the top of my head recall what our revenue generation stream was, but it, it, it generates more revenue than if you rent it out to a private party. But I, I do want to say that if we generate more revenue from events a few times a year, it helps us regulate the cost for renting it to the, the, the citizens that need to come and use those buildings for the events that they have. And so it keeps our cost structure down for everybody else. There's just many benefits. I could go on and on and on, and I know I, I can't, Zach, but um, <laughs> it, there's many reasons why this will work for us very well, and we're happy to follow and follow the county's rules because I think you've done a good job of establishing very thoughtful rules for cannabis. Thank you. Thank you. We have one more. Is there anybody else that would like to speak to this after this? Okay. Good morning, board. Thank you for your time. Uh, we'd also like to, th my name is Seth Smith with Santa Cruz Veterans Alliance. Uh, we'd also like to take a moment to thank uh, Robin for her leadership, um, not just over the past uh, year or so that she's been the head of the Cannabis Licensing Office, but also the several years that she's been involved in this process um, from the beginning. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, we just had a couple of quick questions regarding the event thing. We are in support of events uh, at the fairgrounds. We've been contacted since uh, before the end of, before the end of the last year. Uh, regarding events at the fairgrounds, other groups, outside groups looking to use us as a conduit by which they would be able to host events. Of course, our, our first uh, thought whenever that would happen w was to call Robin and say, who are these people and why are they reaching out to us? <laughs> um, so we haven't been doing any of that. Uh, we, are, we would be interested in doing that as one of the licensed retailers here in the county, um, also as one of the licensed uh, cultivators, uh, actually no longer here in the county, just in the city of Watsonville, where, we, where we've consolidated all of, our pro all of our production, primarily due to uh, regulatory issues and taxes. Um, but we love to sell our, our products uh, from, that we produce in Watsonville at the fairgrounds that are also in Watsonville. Um, with that in mind and with regards to the revenue that that could generate, I have a question regarding the cannabis business tax and the fairgrounds. Um, w would that be the only tax that the cannabis businesses are paying? Would that a tax apply just to cannabis or would it also apply to any other uh, paraphernalia or accessories or uh, apparel or anything like that that was also being sold to fairgrounds? Would the cannabis business tax apply to that? And if it wouldn't, why does it apply to paraphernalia and accessories and apparel that's sold in dispensaries currently. And uh, if, you, if that's not the intent of the board, would you mind changing that? Mm -hmm. um, other than that, we're, we are in support of this and we thank the board for taking the time to consider this. Thank you. Nobody else? All right, we'll bring it back uh, to the board. Comment. Supervisor Leopold. Yeah. Uh, well, I think there were a couple questions there. Maybe Robin, you could answer about the, the who's gonna pay what tax at this event. My understanding is we would simply apply uh, the existing ordinance 4.06 that regulates, uh, which includes uh, paraphernalia and other cannabis related items. So similarly, like the dispensaries, exactly. they would have to pay it on all, all the, that 7% on all uh, on all sales. Um, right. Well, uh, I'm sub, uh, supportive of the recommended actions here. You know, uh, I think uh, we have a very good partner in uh, the Santa Cruz County Fairgrounds Board. Uh, I will put a shameless plug in here that the fair is going to be happening from September 12th to the 16th. Um, and if you're lucky enough to go, uh, I do have a collection in the, uh, in, in the uh, fair this year. Please check it out. It's very colorful. But there, I saw some other collections there. They're fantastic. Anyway, I would move the uh, recommended actions. 
I'll second that. I have a small additional direction, if it's a, and I'll make it and see if it's okay, which is that the cannabis licensing officer submit a report to the board within three months of each event with the information on the number of vendors who participated, the amount of CBT collected, local business participation, and overall evaluation of the event. I'm acceptable to that. Yeah. We have a motion and a second. And, uh, but, uh, Supervisor Caput. Yeah, uh, I, I'll go along with that also, but the uh, the concern I guess I, I still have is uh, somebody from the county will actually be looking and seeing how th this is being run. Uh, and, uh, who is that? The, there's a provision um, that allows, uh, it doesn't designate a specific person, but it could be somebody from our office. Right. Um, it could also be potentially from the auditor's office, but okay. um, yeah, looking at, at um, the collection of taxes and, and general conformance with the rules. Yeah, and the, the concern, the concern <laughs> is we're yeah. talking about yeah. something that is federally illegal. I mean, the state of California, it's, it's legal, and I'm sure that the fairgrounds has backing from the state, but they're not gonna, you're not gonna get any backing from the federal government if something goes wrong. And uh, uh, the other we'll talk about later, I'm still concerned uh, whether or not we've settled anything with packaging on, uh, let's say they're selling brownies, they're selling something that looks like candy, and whether or not it's in a package that uh, uh, is not put on somebody's kitchen table and kids are gonna look at it and think it's uh, something to eat after dinner. The state has very uh, stringent rules about packaging and labeling and right. every licensed vendor would be selling licensed. Uh, well, that would be a concern also for your vendors that, uh, that they're not selling things that are gonna end up doesn't have some kind of a warning or something that kids can't get into. So otherwise, and I guess the other last thing is I just don't want to get a call from uh, the Boy Scouts saying they can't have their jamboree there because uh, the, uh, this event is going to take place. And I, I know you're not going to let that happen. So thank you very much. Can I just ask a point of clarification for Supervisor Coonerty on your intention on this? Because since we get a regular update uh, from the CLO already. I just wasn't sure if we, there would be a way that, so we're not adding additional work onto that, that position that we just, if we could just be wrapped into that. Uh, yeah, it just depends on, I can't remember how is regular the update is. Quarterly. Quarterly. Yeah. Quarterly, so yeah, it can be wrapped into that. Okay. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you all for waiting today. Thank you to Community TV, the Register of Pajaroni, and the Sentinel for covering today. We are adjourned.